So today really what we intended to do is to just to draw some of the excitational points together. So it's, it's more summation rather than brand new material. I'd like to start in uh, 1 Samuel 19 um, from where we left off in the, the sort of hurried finish um, yesterday afternoon. And this was when Saul was chasing after David. Um, David has had to flee. And where does David flee to? He flees, of course, to Samuel. Um, and in chapter 19, and we'll read from verse 23 to 23. We didn't get a chance to read this yesterday. Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying, Samuel standing as appointed over them. Just pause, let that sink in. So Samuel is there surrounded by this company of prophets who were prophesying. As appointed over them, the Spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. And we made the point uh, previously that at the beginning of Saul's reign, even before he was um, crowned as, uh, as king over Israel, that this happened to Saul as well. So this is the full cycle. And when it was told Saul, he sent other messengers and they prophesied likewise. And Saul sent messengers again the third time and they prophesied also. Then went he also to Ramah and came to a great well that is in Secu. And he asked and said, where are Samuel and David? One of them said, behold, they be at Naoth, which was in Ramah. And he went thither to Naoth in Ramah, and the Spirit of God was upon him also. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Naoth in Ramah. And he stripped off his clothes also and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all that day and all that night. Wherefore they say, is Saul also among the prophets? And this is a, a both a sad situation here, isn't it? But in many ways also it is glorious from the, the power of the message that comes out in this particular record. And we made a passing comment earlier in the studies that God sees us for who he wants us to be and who we will be. He could so easily see us for all of our inadequacies, our weaknesses, our fears, our doubts. He could see our sins because they're so evident before him. But God is not wanting to find fault. And we made the comment about how that God's face is by its very nature merciful. And he wants us to be immortalized with him and his son forever. That is God in our life. And he didn't set Saul up for failure. And so here this was a reminder of what it could have been had, had Saul, as it were, bowed the knee to the God, the king of heaven. And allowed that influence in his life. Not to be distracted by the things around him. And, and that's why I feel so much for Saul. Because I see so much of myself in him. And what we have here, sort of on the balance, on the flip side, isn't it? Of the wonderful things that were happening at Naoth. It even had this... You know, you might say this supernatural effect upon Saul to change him into another man. And this was what was happening here in this place. And it was what was happening in other places throughout Israel. Because as we discussed in that 20 years, Samuel had established places like this. This Naoth. I've got a hunch that this is you know, a name which probably describes 
the school of the prophets because it's in Ramah, it's in his hometown. And so when I've kept on saying, you know, that Samuel went home, you know, home to Elkanah and Hannah, he went home to this township, but really he was always at home with God, wasn't he? And so he established this place. Now, in Naoth in Ramah, was it the, the, the trappings of the, the tabernacle? Well, they may have been sort of there. They may have been hidden somewhere in that area. We don't know what had happened to that, but he didn't go back to re-establish tabernacle worship. And as one brother beautifully said yesterday, you know, that what impressed him in thinking about these studies was from his own work was that that's exactly right. No, Samuel never ever tried to reunite the ark with the tabernacle because Samuel understood God and understood what he was trying to do. And yeah, we do things, brothers and sisters, don't we? That's what we've been trying to say throughout the week. We do things in our ecclesias because they're efficient and because they're right to have decency and order. Otherwise, you end up with anarchy and chaos. But they're just those, they're tools, aren't they, to bring about the effective work of God in our life. Because if we live just by tradition or if we live by the trappings of what we do and our heart's not in it, then, then God is not there in our lives. We can't answer for somebody else because you know they might have seen that. And if you talk to the older ones in the meeting, even older than me, but if you talk to the older ones in the meeting, you, you, you can see that. By having that discussion, you can find that that they have that understanding. They know that's true. That God is about here and about here. And so I think that's quite beautiful that, that David, who was of the same spirit, obviously, a man after God's heart, like Samuel, would seek this, this aged man out, the age perhaps of 90, and he was a young man, about to become king and uh, and together they sit down and we didn't have a lot of time to talk about what they took i mean we, we sort of said yes they talked about the kingdom and all those aspects of it they talked about the need obviously for the word of god to be very very foremost in people's lives and how to achieve that and that's what we do don't we brothers and sisters we sit down and, you know, like Matt and the, the committee in organising this particular week together, they'd obviously discuss their purpose. And I think everything we ought to do in the truth, we ought to discuss purpose. What are we trying to achieve? Whether it's a school or whether it's an ecclesia or ecclesias, we, we need to talk about and, and think about what's our purpose in this and how with God's blessing, are we going to have things that will bring about? And I, I'm going to say that yesterday afternoon was absolutely beautiful. Someone said, oh, wh why didn't you have, you know, why didn't Enfield have a study last night? And as I was sitting there enjoying it, it was so beautiful out there, wasn't it? And as I was sitting out there, I was observing. And I saw the effectiveness of the word of God. I was listening on conversations that was perhaps happening over here and over here, eavesdropping, I suppose. And it was so delightful to hear people enjoying company and with, you know, around the word of God. And it was the things that were stimulating the conversations and people catching up and talking about what's really important in this rather challenging world as the hymn that we just sung. And so David, with the aged Samuel, talked about how the teaching Levites and how the prophets were going to play a significant role. Did, have you noticed in David's life that the prophets are always there? They were encouraged, weren't they? There wasn't just Nathan. There was others as well, seers, as they're called 
including Samuel's own grandson, Heman, who led the music, was also a prophet. So there was the teaching element through those lyrics and through the psalms and the songs and the, spirit, the hymns and spiritual songs that we have. Because Samuel and David both understood it's about our life 24-7. It wasn't about ritual. And yes, David wanted to build so badly that house of God as a focus for the ecclesia, wasn't it? He wasn't permitted to do that. But David, like Samuel, never ever lost an opportunity to educate spiritually those that were around him. And unlike Saul, and we made a comment yesterday afternoon that how, how different Saul's kingdom would have been had he allowed Samuel and David and Jonathan to be with him and working in that. And I think David saw that inadequacy. And so David surrounded himself, not by a bodyguard. They were his friends and brothers and spiritual helpers. And they thought he was their father because he was the lamp of God. And so that's what it's all about. Our theme this week has been about legacy, isn't it? And uh, just talking before the meeting, we we're saying how that legacy is not a biblical term. And really is only God that can actually decide what is a legacy. It's not for us. And we don't do things to create a legacy. And as I shared with you yesterday briefly, that uh, sometimes the things that we think might be a legacy are not really that in the end. Because it's all about whether people have learnt, whether people have been aided and assisted in our walk. So it's interesting, isn't it, that in the life of Samuel, um, we only have snapshots. 12 years, 30 years, just like our Lord, 50 years, 90 years. And there's lessons all the way through there, isn't there? We, we considered how he came. He was the product in that sense of this beautiful coupling of Hannah and Elkanah. People of integrity, people of dedication, people of prayer, regardless of the environment in which they, they were in. So when they came into the midst, God came into the midst. They were the lights shining in darkness. And this beautiful couple wanted a child, wanted a son, wanted a deliverer, wanted a reformer, wanted a faithful priest to serve God and his anointed forever. And so they dedicated their son as a Nazarite, didn't they? However, that son which they nurtured and they educated for that, you know, what would have sent, seemed like seconds of life, really, before they gave him up to God. That son, of course, embraced the spirit of the Nazarite in his life. And he lived that out. The spirit of that, that whole concept was seen in him. And he grew up. Much like his dad, who was this dedicated, trustworthy, responsible, dutiful Levite, who no doubt already taught, as a teaching priest, taught those in and around the hill country of Ephraim. And he grew up like his mother, this respectful my Lord, she called Eli, this respectful, passionate and deeply spiritual sister. So he grew up to be truthful, 
unafraid to speak up what's right, but beautifully balanced with this loving disposition, determined to support all in their journey towards God's kingdom. No ambition. And when Samuel helped out, there was no strings attached. They had no agenda to sort of you know, promote himself. No, he loved working in the shadows. God thrust him into the limelight to right the wrongs that needed to be righted. And Hannah knew that those things needed to be done and that was the absolute basis of her prayer, that heartfelt prayer in tears that God might work through her and work through her son to bring about the salvation of her people. And that he did. He saved them from the Philistines and for the other enemies from without and he saved them from the corruption and the violence and the arrogance of the brazen mouths of the wicked, those who grew fat on stolen meat and it caused people to hate the things of God. He'd save them from the enemy within. But he knew that it was God's way to change things by reform. So he didn't wield the sword like the Levitical fathers that he came from amongst his brethren. No, he had the still small voice. Yes, he was firm and determined and, and that sword did come out, didn't it, against Agag. He wasn't frightened to use it if God had dictated that it needed to be done. But no, he understood that it was essential to save his ecclesia by promoting that the word of God was indeed precious. As Hannah foresaw, through Samuel, her, his, her son, the hungry would be fed, the lowly would be raised up, the poor would be made rich and they would all ultimately inherit the throne of glory. She knew that God would keep the feet of his saints for out of heaven he would thunder upon his enemies and that he would bring joy to the world by exalting the horn of his anointed and giving strength to his king. Samuel lived that out, didn't he? Honour God, save others. A simple message for life. Samuel's character, of course, his motivation and attitude then was moulded by this. He was one with God, one with mum, one with dad, in purpose and with method. He knew what was right and he knew how to achieve that. And so in the consideration of this throughout the week, there have been lessons for all, haven't there? Let's think about it. We had a, a session almost totally with the 12 year olds and younger in, in front of me here. All right. So the lessons for the very young, I looked at you then, Perhaps I should have looked out there. Well, yeah. No, lessons for the very young, lesson for the teens, lessons for the 30-year-olds, lessons for the 50-year-olds, lessons for the older ones, married, single, male, female, children or none, low, sort of loving families or difficult, complex situations because they're in existence in our ecclesias today supportive friends, those who feel isolated. There are lessons here which we've considered throughout the week and I hope that we've learnt much through that. 
Difficult situations? Well, could it get it any more difficult than those early days that we talked about? But they remained focused on their king. They were respectful to others. They were positive and keen to share. They encouraged godliness in others, didn't they? They saw the best and they tried to work to bring that out. And I think that's for all the, the older ones in our midst. When I say older, perhaps I'm talking about those oh, at least 30, um, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 plus. What's our role as you get older? Well, I think our role is exactly what Samuel has shown us. It's, it's to try and create a situation where the younger ones discover things for themselves so that they also might fall in love with God and Christ and God's word. Because that's the only way that they will be inspired to get off their backside and get involved within the ecclesias. And I, I think it's, you know, we've got to take the seat back and sometimes we've got to do this. Button our lips. Oh, we know how, you know, like, you know, someone, young brother gets up to do a talk and we've gone, oh, we've heard that before. Or we know all of those things, but it, it, it's only right to go up and with wide eyes and, 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 Pretend perhaps that you didn't know those points, you know. To mentor, to guide, to strengthen, to allow them room to move. <laughs> Today is not so much for the anecdotes, but I, I do pause there and think that I once, obviously many years ago, because I'm going to say it was when I was 50, um, someone rang me up and said, oh, would I write a play? Because I'd always been... a playwright and you know writing lyrics for songs and things like that and and uh, you know would I write a play for the young people and I just went ah oh, can't you ask one of the younger ones and they went oh no 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 we want a good product and I said but I've been writing plays since I was 18 you know why ask me when I'm 50 to write something that was relevant to those that group you know we've got a let go, don't we? You know. Oh no, they're too young to uh, run those seminars. They're only 40. <laughs> that kind of thinking, brothers and sisters, is not helpful, is it really? But it's difficult because we've got a long life in the truth. And it's difficult sometimes to allow that generational thing. But it is. It's what Samuel and David were doing. And it's so beautiful when you see the younger ones wanting the involvement and the, and the comments and the guidance and the advice from the older ones and, and the older ones, you know, working with the younger ones and, and you know, sort of com commenting positively on, on, on their attempts at doing things within the ecclesia. That, this is what God gave us the ecclesia for this, that God might be seen working in our lives. They never stopped praying for others. Never stopped praying for others. And they taught the good and right way. And Samuel exhorted them to fear Yahweh and serve him in truth and with all your hearts. As a young child, he he learned this, didn't he? And he practiced this, this, you know, to be part of it. He he wanted to do things. At a twelve year old, he each morning he's one of his roles, which he took not only, you know, he was diligent in it, but with great delight to open the doors of the house, whatever that meant. <laughs> um, but to open the doors obviously is to allow people in and to keep the lamp burning. Now, whether that was literal, which I don't think it was, but certainly to keep the lamp of God's word, which was growing dim, as it says, like the eyes of Eli, um, he understood the importance of God's word to be burning and uh, providing that light to the feet. And they loved the gathering, wasn't it? I, 
one of the studies, I think it was Wednesday night, we finished off, you know, with, well, what was the legacy to all Israel? And it was, he encouraged the gathering of the ecclesia, of the people of God, so that they could be exhorted and, and encouraged to return unto Yahweh with all your hearts and renew the kingdom. And we need to do that. We're here today, brothers and sisters, to remember what God has done through the Lord Jesus Christ here. And we, we come with great delight, don't we? And our solemnities here really mask the joy that should be in our heart for the wonderful things that God has done. And even though our life might be full of incredible challenges at the moment, whether that's you know, physically or emotionally, and may even be spiritually, the pressures of this world might be you know, collapsing our families or our friendships, whatever those circumstances. Do you know scripturally, and we found this in the, in the uh, School of the Prophets, uh, where's Jesse? Um, the topic was discovering joy and the joy of discovering. And in that study, the one thing I wanted the boys to actually discover for themselves, among a lot of good and cool tools, a you know, Bible study, but out of all of that was that you can be unhappy and full of joy at the same time. Because life sometimes makes us cry, and yet in our heart we know that God has redeemed us and promised us immortality. And so we can bring burdens to the memorial meeting and just lay those burdens on God and be overwhelmed with what God's done. That can, and so many times, does happen in our life, doesn't it? So Samuel has reminded us of the importance of of serving others with joy in our hearts. He modelled, didn't he? Selflessness, a humble mindset. Don't forget the time, of course, when he was asked to go against what he knew or what he believed in his heart was, was wrong in, in crowning a human king. But he threw himself 110%. I oh, know that's not possible, but you understand my hyperbole there. Threw himself totally behind the development, the spiritual development of God's choice, Saul. He'd been right in opposing the demands, yes, but he put aside his own personal feelings on that so that he would be there for the ecclesia because he knew the importance of a man after God's own heart being on the throne. And wouldn't it be good in our ecclesia if we could park our opinions outside the door to allow God to direct the ecclesia by wise advice? We too, brothers and sisters, can do a mighty work today in supporting our brothers and sisters on their journey, young people and ecclesia. That's why Samuel you know, established the schools of the prophets, wasn't it? And it's delightful in those just little, we found those little nuances where these groups of people it kept on saying that the spirit of God was in them. Now, of course, when they prophesied, that probably was the Holy Spirit in a miraculous sense in the words of prophecy. But for the majority of the time, they were like us, weren't they? Not of the priestly family, not of the Levitical tribe, but brothers and sisters who allowed, who wanted God to work in their life. And so the Spirit of God was in those places. And they were educational places. Appropriate that we're here in the Hall of Heritage College. Okay? They were educational places. They went to learn the Word of God. They went to school. It 
What a wonderful thing that is, that in our ecclesias, that we can value that. Encourage that. Appreciate that and applaud that. Acknowledge it within our ecclesias when we see people striving to allow God's influence, God's spirit to be seen. Samuel also taught us that we must stand firm when it comes to the things of God's holiness. And I'm going to appeal to the old ones here because I know it's distressing for you all to look at how quickly the world is deteriorating. Right? They call it the postmodern world where there are no absolute truths. And I know out of concern, sometimes bordering on fear, we can come across perhaps a little stronger than we ought to to the young people who are growing up in this particular world. It's like a goldfish bowl. It's totally surrounding them, no matter how much we try and combat that, perhaps with such as the establishment of a Heritage College and what we're doing in our young people's group and Sunday schools. They are growing up in an environment where they are being bombarded by this. No absolute truths. Everything is up for question and you make your own rules. And older ones, part of that is that they don't learn anything from older people. So if we fall into the trap, we can come down in our fear, in our concerns, to say, no, this is the way it's got to be done. Not realising that the world has already predisposed the kids not to receive that. So in many ways, we've, we're actually falling into the trap but what Samuel did in the like a previous postmodern world, okay, surrounded by this, it was the still small word. It it was the appeal, and that really truly has always been the case. Really, if you think about it, how does God educate? Look at the life of the Lord Jesus Christ and His approach. Yes. He rebuked the elders who should have known better. He confronted the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. But look how he dealt with the multitude. And it was the same method as well as the same message. And in reality, brothers and sisters, if you think of it, our young people, if we, if we appeal to it, if we feel sorry for the world around, and then adjust the way our approach is so that we can actually counter it because God says the counter is here on the table the counter is what God has done through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ through his life and his sacrifice and what that has pointed for when God raised Jesus from the grave. We know that he is the first fruit. For a multitude of people. And that appeal is still relevant today. Regardless of the postmodern world. Because their world offers nothing. Absolute truths. Well, during this week, we've talked about those rock-like principles. They're the things that we need just to be continually, I mean continually, not deviating from. That we're talking to the kids about the opposite of death, and that is life. And Moses said, choose life. You, you close your eyes in the, you know, Deuteronomy 30, 31, okay? And if you close your eyes, you think it's New Testament, don't you? What Moses is saying. Why? Because he saw the spirit of the law. He saw what God was trying to do. He knew it was about this and about this. And so the appeal was the same. 
We need to actually gently show them the better way, the more excellent way of God as king in our life and the gift of eternity versus what the world can offer a fleeting moment of a bit of a giggle followed by eternal death. Not much of a contest really, is it? So Samuel stood up for that which was right and he also, of course, acted at times very strongly in when he said and saw that things were killing others. He acted. We made a passing comment previous study about Samuel's sons and although this was buried in my work notes which are pretty thick back at home on the desk um, a brother came up yesterday I'm very grateful because he gave me pieces that actually put it together because I sort of said oh, even if you know we I want to believe that his sons actually turned around, um, but look, look at his grandson. You know, look, Heman was ended up, you know, head of the whole of the worship of the of the kingdom in David's day, and he was also the king's seer, and 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 it's beautiful. And a few of you sort of said, "Oh, that was so lovely," but I've got something better for you, thanks to this brother. Can you turn to First Samuel chapter eight? said I wasn't going to mention any names but thanks Phil for this um, chapter 8 we'll read verses 1 to 3 it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel probably because he wanted just to extend he, he, on his circuit he didn't get down to Beersheba it was a long way away now the name verse 2 now the name of his firstborn was Joel in my margin you see it says Vashni as well so he had you know two names and the name of his second was Abiah, and they were judges way down in Beersheba. But here Israel say, and his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after Lucre, and took bribes, and perverted judgment. And you go, oh dear. And I made just a passing comment there about how we can wrongly judge, and jump in and say, oh, well Samuel made a mistake, he wasn't home, da da da, you know, make all those kinds of judgmental cause but it is sad that they're here and I made the comment that that I'm hopeful that they made a change but it was identified that in yesterday's reading chapter 12 we read again carefully verses 1 to 3 it says and Samuel said unto all Israel behold I have hearkened unto your voice in all that you've said unto me and I've made a king over you so here's Saul standing next to him and now behold, the king walketh before you. Now, again, you know, here's Samuel's taking a step back, isn't it? It's like now, yes, you wanted a king, and here he is. And Samuel would step back, support Saul as much as he can. And I'm old and grey-headed, and behold, my sons are with you. Now, there's an implication there, isn't there? Four chapters earlier, those sons were doing the wrong thing. Here he's saying, and my sons are with you. Now, if they remain rat bags, then surely they wouldn't be there and he wouldn't be drawing attention. We'll keep on reading to make it quite clear. And it says, and I have walked before you from my childhood unto this day. Behold, here I am, witness against me before Yahweh and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose ass have I taken? Okay. Um, or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Or whose hand have I received any bribe to blind mine eyes therewith? And I'll restore it with you. <laughs> I mean, this is a brother that is not backward in actually addressing pinpointedly his own problem in his house. Right? 
Yeah, but that's not the end of the story. Can you go across to First Chronicles chapter 6? And this is the penny that, that was in my work notes, but it hadn't dropped until yesterday. And we're going to read verses 28 to 33. Because this is in the Chronicles, this is David's kingdom. And we read in verse 28, and the sons of Samuel, first Chronicles 6, 28, and the sons of Samuel, here they are, named first Vashni and Abiah, the two sons of Samuel. We're not talking about other boys. The sons of Merari, Malai, Libni, his son, Shimei's son, Azari's son, we're not as much interested in them. Shimea his son, Haggai his son, and Asiah his son. Verse 31. And these are they whom David set over the service of song in the house of Yahweh after that the ark had rest. And they ministered before the dwelling place of the tabernacle of the congregation with singing until Solomon had built the house of Yahweh in Jerusalem. And then they waited on their office according to their order. And these are they that waited with their children of the sons of the Kohathites, Heman, a singer, son of Joel, son of Shemuel, or Samuel. So it's not just the grandson who shines and is a very important um, person in David's kingdom. And it's, it's Samuel's boys are there. And you know what the excitation to me is, brothers and sisters, and I, you know, Val and I sadly have a son who's stepped away from the truth, um, is never give up. Place the matter in God's hands. Samuel had obviously spoken. Well, I'll hint. It seems very you know, obviously that he had spoken to them, rebuked them, and they've come on board. So much so that David says, I want you to lead the singing in the temple. And they're not way down in Beersheba. He's probably moved them up. And here they are in around Jerusalem for the uh, worship of God and for the encouragement through song and word. Because they were teaching Levites that people might be encouraged in God. Brothers and sisters, there have been lots of lessons, isn't it? But probably one of the greatest, like our daily reading in Exodus, isn't it? For today, 33, 34, Samuel is also an advocate, an intercessor, but an advocate for his people. They begged him, cease not to cry unto Yahweh our God for us, that he will save us. And God heard and God acted just as God hears us and God acts on our behalf. He has acted, he is acting now and he will act on behalf of us. And we have the Lord Jesus Christ here. And it's so beautiful if we went across to Jeremiah chapter 15 verse 1 and we won't, that Samuel is aligned with Moses as these two great men that loved their people so much that they could not stop praying for them. What a wonderful thing that would be. But our focus, of course, is on the Lord Jesus Christ. Our focus is on our advocate, our intercessor. And that's why we had Hebrews read this morning. And I'd just like to read just a few sections out of Hebrews to draw our mind to the great mediator. The one that God has supplied. So if you go across to the book of Hebrews, and we'll just read a few verses. Hebrews chapter 3, first of all. We'll just follow this through. I was, you know, just, you know, whilst Peter was reading the Hebrews chapter 7, and, you know, I did this deliberate. You go, it's talking about Melchizedek, Jesus in the line of Melchizedek. But in reality, Samuel's still in there, in, a, in, in, in like in spirit is in there too, because he was outside the Levitical. He wasn't a priest, but God called him to be a priest, just as Melchizedek, in that sense, was the king priest. They, they, they're standing for God's work that he's done, not through law, but understanding the law and focusing on the grace. So in chapter 3 and in verse 6, we read, 
but Christ as a son over his own house. So we're not of the house of Samuel, brothers and sisters. We're here today because we're of the house of Christ. And whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing unto the hope Firm of the hope, firm unto the end. What a beautiful exhortation of us to be consistent because of what God has done for us. Chapter 4, verses 14 to 16, words known only to us so very well. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Let's not waver. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And that's, we don't, I hope that we're moved by this. It's not an academic understanding of the doctrine of the atonement here. It's talking about this. It's talking about, you know, Christ working in our life. God's being there and that we're part of this and they understand what they're going through and they want they want us to live forever. And how beautiful is it that the one who's standing by us, our advocate, our intercessor, is also has been appointed as the judge by God. Can you ask for anything better than that? The one that's, that's there in our corner, as it were, is also the judge. So that's just showing, isn't it, how much God wants us there to share eternity with them. Chapter 5 goes on in verses 6 to 9. You know, he says, says also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he'd offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears against like Samuel's family, isn't it? unto him that was able to save him from death and, and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he the obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. And over again into chapter 12, verse 2. All right, again, the, the work of Jesus and God to, to bring about our salvation, looking unto, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, he despised the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so we come to the emblems, brothers and sisters, just by reading verses 22 to 25 of, of chapter 7 and drawing our thoughts of the whole week, I think, together, where it ought to be, which is upon our knees before our God and our King and so very grateful of the one that he has supplied, the true deliverer, the great high priest and King. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death, but this, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save us to the uttermost that got come, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. And we answer Hannah's prayer. Amen.